Well, thank you, Peter, and thank you, everyone, for the, the warm welcome we've had this morning. We do enjoy coming to Nelson Bay. It's a bit of a hike, but uh, uh, we, we enjoy the fellowship that we have here, a and the children's stories, of course, as well. Yes. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Lord, as we come into your presence this morning, into your house to worship you, we ask that you would still our hearts and quiet our minds, that we might hear your voice through scripture as we reflect on it. Bless us now, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the story is told, I think, of William Sankey, who was the, uh, the great collaborator of D.L. Moody, the 19th century evangelist. And uh, Sankey, as I think it was, went to the United Kingdom on an evangelistic crusade by himself without Moody. And uh, as he uh, was preaching a series of sermons, one, uh, one day a, a gentleman there in the city decided he would go and hear what Sankey had to say in his preaching. And he went and he sat there in the hall and Sankey came to the podium and said, well, ladies and gentlemen, I, I wondered what I should preach on tonight. And I know that I preached on it last night, but I can think of no greater text to preach on than John 3.16. So I am going to preach on John 3.16 again tonight. Like Sankey, I think there's no greater text, and so I'm going to preach on John 3.16 as well. The greatest text in the Bible, one that we all know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. There we have the greatest giver, God, the greatest gift, his only begotten son, the greatest offer to whoever believes, the greatest reward, might not perish, but have eternal life. Such a beautiful text in, in all its simplicity and all its power, but... But there is a problem with John 3.16 when we stop and think about it. And that's that word right there towards the beginning, actually closer to the middle, begotten. That God gave his only begotten son. It is a word I guess that we don't use that often. What does it mean? Well, if you look it up in a dictionary, you'll see that it has to do with um, fathering, uh, having, having progeny. You remember perhaps the, the uh, wonderful little story that Uncle Arthur tells in uh, his Bible story set of the little girl who was asked, what is your favorite part of the Bible? What is your favorite story in the Bible? And she'd say, oh, I love the begats. You love the what? The begats. And, and uh, Maxwell had to say to her, what does that mean? Oh, I don't know. I just love the word begats. And he had to tell her, it means had a baby, had a child, was the father of. So Abraham begat Isaac. Abraham was the father of Isaac. And begat, of course, is related directly to this word begotten. Of course, once we start using this language, we start to puzzle about God and the relation of God uh, and the Son, the Father and the Son. Because the one thing that we know for certain 
in this world is that a father is always older than his son. It's always. Father comes first. In fact, the word begotten, for some people, would immediately uh, imply sexual relationships, sexual reproduction. And I've seen comments that have come from people looking at Christianity from outside, from a Jewish perspective or from an Islamic perspective. And they see this word begotten and they go, this is blasphemy to suggest that God somehow had a son, that there is some sort of sexual reproduction. This is paganism. And I want to say I am very sympathetic to that reaction. If that's what it means, I would think the same thing. This is paganism. Interestingly, the term begotten was no problem for the early church. I mean, John's Gospel was included in the Bible. It calls Jesus God's only begotten Son. And as the church over the next couple of hundred years spent time looking at how do we, how do we define the relationship of Father and Son, Eventually, at the Council of Nicaea, they developed a creedal statement. And I want to read this to you this morning. Uh, it, it, no, let me read it first. It says, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, in all things, vis and, uh, sorry, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, uh, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven and the Holy Spirit was and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate by the Virgin Mary and became man. And it goes on a little, a little more, talks about the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. But did you notice that in that small passage, twice, it talks about Jesus being begotten. They obviously had no problem uh, with this terminology. They, they were obviously quite comfortable Begotten, not made. So the problem seems to be ours, not, not the ancients. One of the ways the church dealt with this, after Nicaea, that became the dominant understanding. The church worked with it and polished it and tweaked it and burnt heretics who opposed it. Uh, but eventually, this became the dominant position of the church. Uh, Council, the Creed of Nicaea was, was changed and added to and taken away from, but the basic picture remained fairly constant. So how did they understand begetting of Jesus? The church developed the idea of the eternal begetting of Jesus. Theology, particularly as the church developed, became very philosophical. Let me give you an illustration of what they meant. Just reach over for a second book. If I put a book on the table, it's there. If I put a book on top of it, the first book had to be there first, didn't it? You see? in order for me to have this book on top of it, this book being the Bible. But what if those two books were always there? If they were always one on top of the other? 
if there was never a time in all eternity when one book was not there on top of the other. And so the church's philosophers and theologians said, this is what it meant. Yes, God, uh, Jesus is begotten. The Son is begotten of the Father, but he's always been begotten. There was never a time when he was not begotten. Now, if you're struggling with this, it means you're not a philosopher. <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. Lots of Christians have believed in the eternal uh, begetting of Jesus, the, the Son. This is, this is something that I guess I believe for a long time as the most likely explanation as I've puzzled over this text. But I've come to wonder if this is really what the Bible meant. The Bible is not a, a particularly philosophical book. The Bible is designed for simple people. Now Jesus said to Peter, feed my sheep. He didn't say feed my giraffes. Uh, those, who can, those who can access the simple message of scripture, the sheep, not necessarily the philosophers and the giraffes. And so I want to have a look in a little more detail today at Jesus as the only begotten. The words only begotten in English are one word in Greek. One word, the word monogonis. And it's a compound word. We're used to compound words, words that are made up of two other words. And this word, I don't usually launch into the Greek in the, in the pulpit, but just bear with me for a moment. Monogonese. Mono, well, we know what mono means. A monoplane has one wing. A monograph has only one author. A monopod, only one foot. Yeah? So mono is only or one. And uh, as people looked at this rather rare word, they said, well, the other half of it must come from the verb genao, which means to bear or be born. And we have this word in a lot of our English words, don't we? To generate or generations. That comes from the same Greek word. And when you put those two words together, you have only begotten. And there's the one word. But today, we know, we're quite confident, that monogenes does not come from genao. It comes from a different Greek word, genos, which means kind or type. And if you have a science background, you would understand the genus of an animal or a plant. It's part of the classification, you see from this Greek word. And so if you look in a modern translation of the Bible of John 3.16, it generally will not say the only begotten Son. It will generally say the one and only Son or the unique Son or something of that kind. My uh, English Standard Version that I'm using here, uh, he gave his only Son, his only Son his unique or special son. Now, of course, unique can mean uh, only begotten. One of the reasons you could be a unique child in a family is that you're the only child, you see. And when you come to the New Testament, there are places when this Greek word is used in exactly that way. Come with me to Luke's Gospel. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 and verse 12. 
As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow. There was a considerable crowd. This is the son of the widow of Nain. The only child. Literally, it's that same word. The only begotten child. Why is he the only child of the, of the widow? Presumably, she's, he is the only child she's ever had. Now, it's possible he was the only surviving child, although seeing as he's dead at this stage, I think that's unlikely. So he's the only child she'd had. He's unique. He's, he's one of a kind, literally. Come over to Luke chapter 9 and you'll see the same sort of usage. Luke 9 and coming down to verse 38. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. Again, it's the only child this man has had, presumably. Now, most of us come from families where we're not an only child. But my, my son and his wife have decided to have one child. I, I gave us our first biological granddaughter. Peter, I appreciate what you've been feeling this week. Yeah? And she is the only child of that family. As these characters in the Gospel of Luke are the only child. But what is it that makes Jesus, the Son of God, the unique, the only Son? The word uh, monogenes is used of Jesus five times in the New Testament, all by the Apostle John. Four times in his gospel, one time in his first letter. And as we, as we look at these five instances, some very interesting things emerge. And I remember as I was researching uh, this topic, being struck by the theme that kept coming out whenever Jesus is referred to as the only begotten. There's an immediate reference to the incarnation of the Son of God, that the, the Word became flesh, that the Son of God came to this earth. And in fact, we could almost substitute, incarnate for only begotten. Come with me to John chapter 1 and let's, let's notice this. John chapter 1. In verse 14, this of course is, is the high point of John's prologue as he talks about the Word, the Word who was with God in the beginning, who made all things, who was with God and was God. And yet in verse 14 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. When did we see his glory? When he became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw the glory of the incarnate Son of God. Come down to verse 18, same chapter. No one has ever seen God, the only God. Now there's a text, textual uh, a variant in the manuscripts here. The only begotten God or the only begotten Son or is it the only begotten? The manuscripts don't agree. The only begotten Son who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. No one has seen God. But we have seen Jesus incarnate 
living amongst us, revealing to us what God is like. Come over to John 3 and verse 16. This most famous of all verses, and we scarcely have to read it to see the point. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When? When did he give? Well, he sent him as a baby to Bethlehem to live, to die on the cross. He gives him in his incarnation. For God so loved the world that he gave us his incarnate son. And whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Come down just a couple of verses to verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he did not believe, he has not believed, in the name of the only Son of God. You say, oh, okay, where's the incarnation? Where's the incarnation? Well, we had it in verse 16. Just look at verse 19, the next verse. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. The sun has come into the world. And people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. But again, the focus is on Jesus leaving heaven, coming into this world of darkness as saviour and redeemer of lost men and women. One more text. 1 John chapter, chapter 4. First John chapter 4. And verse 9. In this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. God sent his only Son into the world. God sent his incarnate Son as a genuine human being into the world that we might be saved through him. You know, that's the biblical data on the only begotten Son. That's all the verses in the Bible that refer to Jesus as only begotten. There's not many. There's only five. And in fact, we've read all the verses in the New Testament that use the word. The two in Luke, the five that John uses, Except for one, there's one more verse left. And it's in the book of Hebrews. And I would invite you to come to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 17. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Who, who, and he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son. That's the same word. It's the only begotten of John 3.16. And if you've got the King James Version, I believe that's what it will say. You see, only begotten. Um, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able to raise him from the dead, from which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. All right. I've got a question for you. Was Isaac Abraham's only son? No. He's got Ishmael. Is... Isaac, Abraham's oldest son. Because the oldest son is special as well. 
No, no. Isaac is neither the only son nor the firstborn son, but he is the unique son. Why? Because he is the son of promise. He's the son through whom Messiah will come. You see? He's the special one in God's plan. And isn't it interesting where the writer of Hebrews goes in talking about this? What is it that he says about uh, Abraham and particularly about Isaac? Oh, figuratively. Abraham offers up Isaac. What does that mean? That's death. That's death. When Abraham's there at the altar with the knife in his hand, the next, the next um, scene in this drama is the knife plunging into the heart of Isaac. And the angel stops him. And Abraham receives Isaac back from the dead, as it were. Hebrews says, figuratively. What is the Incarnation all about? The Incarnation to give us a, a picture of the glory of heaven? Uh, if that was what the Incarnation was all about, Jesus wouldn't have been born in a stable. You see? Jesus is born in a stable. Gladys, you grew up in a farm. Stables. Clean well-centered uh, places that, that you love being, uh, that you could eat your dinner off the floor. No. They, that they're dirty, they stink, they're full of animals. That's where Jesus was born. That's not what heaven's like. That isn't why Jesus was incarnate. He was incarnated so he could die for sinners and be raised to life by the power of God. That's what the Incarnation's about. Jesus, the Son, God's unique Son. Oh, it's not philosophy. It's not something that happened way back in the dim, dark ages of eternity. That's not what makes Jesus the unique Son of God. What makes Jesus the unique Son of God is that though he was in the form of God and thought that not to be robbery, he emptied himself and took the form of a man, a servant, and died even the death of the cross, says Paul to the Philippians. That's what makes the Son of God unique. Let's look at one last text, Ephesians chapter 5. We didn't go to Philippians, we probably should have, but let's go to Ephesians at least. Ephesians chapter 5. And Paul says, and walk in love as, Christ's, uh, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. A fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. This is what makes Jesus the unique Son of God. This is what makes the God we worship unique that he emptied heaven of the best there was. His own son, who loved us and gave himself up for us. And I don't want to direct your minds today to philosophy and say, oh, you must understand philosophy and you must believe philosophy. I want to direct your minds to the cross of Christ and the love of God 
for there is a God worth worshipping. There is a God who will do everything that can be done to save us. May God bless each one of us. Oh Lord, how truly amazing it is, amazing love, that Jesus, the eternal Son, left the glories and splendours of heaven for the darkness of this world, who came and lived among <coughs> sinners, reviled and despised by them, tortured and finally killed by them, in order to save us, in order to save me. Lord, this morning, we are lost in wonder at that love. We say to you today, here I am, Lord. Take me, use me as you would, mould me as you can, for I am yours, bought with price. Lord, bless us as we go from this place, that we might hold fast to our conviction of your love for us, the sacrifice of Christ, until we see him appear in the clouds that great last day, and the battle with sin finally will be over on planet Earth. Bless us now, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.